welcome to the Halloween special of the Failing Writers Podcast. Woohoo! What are you doing? What do you mean? Why are you doing it like that? Well, you said do it sparky. Sorry, that's my fat thumbs. I typed on my phone. That's supposed to say spooky. Oh, right. Okay, that makes more sense. Welcome to the Halloween special of the Feeling Writers Podcast. Tom, are you a fan of spooky stuff? Uh, Here's the thing. I can imagine you sitting around a fire and telling other people ghost stories and properly freaking them out whilst not being remotely moved by them yourself. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I struggle to suspend my disbelief for ghost stories. Right. I always find that with horror movies and stuff. It's like, oh, yeah, whatevs, come on. Do you think that's across the board? Not just for horror, for, for other things as well. No, you? not really. No, no, no. But it is particularly, it's like, supernatural stuff, when it gets a bit daft. Maybe it's a, a bit of a... A natural self-preservation thing. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. You know when people see something bad happen to someone else, they're always very quick to go, ah, well, you see, what kind of idiot doesn't <laughs> wear a helmet while the bungee jumping on? It's always a... Yeah, yeah. There's always something they kind of pick out as, well, I wouldn't do that and get in trouble and hurt myself or die. <laughs> what an idiot. Yeah. I wonder if there's a bit of an element of that kind yeah, of like... Yeah. Uh, Why are you going out? You know there's something scary out there. What are you doing going outside? Don't go outside! Yeah, just yeah. don't go outside. What are you doing? I wouldn't do that. That's ridiculous. This is ridiculous! <laughs> But no, I, I kind of I enjoy them, but on a detached watching level, probably rather than an immersive, right? Scary level. That's interesting. I love, I yeah, I love ghost stories, and I, I I don't really understand why. I think I find it really fascinating that you can have these, you can have this sort of double think going yeah. on where you you know they're not real, yeah, yeah, and you know the ra- the rational bit of me has absolutely no belief in it whatsoever. But, but I, I mean, that's the same with anything, though, isn't it? Any any entertainment form. There's, there's an element of that. That's maybe why I like... I do like the sort of the biopic based on a true story. Mm. That gets me. I always like that more. Mm. So maybe maybe I'm just... Uh, a realist. Just a real boring yeah. realist who can't enjoy things <laughs> for the sake of... Yeah. I think ghost stories as well, they have a context, don't they? Like, this t- there's something special about this time of year. Yeah. When it's, like, misty and dark outside. And it's like if you if you read them out in a candle lit room with some other people, that is a it's a very different experience to just reading a story during the yeah, day. Yeah, than a brightly lit Starbucks or yeah, something. Yeah. yeah, I've got a real ghost story, Tom. Hmm. I've got a real ghost story. Something that happened to me. Right. When I was about eleven or twelve. Uh, but annoyingly, I'm going to save it because we've got some more spooky stuff coming up later in the year. Uh, so I'm going to make you wait for that story. Okay. Uh, and also, we've got to crack on with this chat, haven't we? Because yeah. we have got two ridiculously brilliant guests. I was thinking before the chat, I think it's probably worth mentioning, for anyone who's too young to remember or lives in a different country, I think we need to go over a particular moment in TV history, which we mentioned last week. Um, so on Halloween night, 1992, a one-off TV programme called Ghost Watch went out live on TV. And uh, it was... It was basically investigating spooky goings on at um, a sort of boring little suburban house in the UK. And then there was also back in the BBC studio was the legend Michael Parkinson. And also Mike Smith was manning the phone lines as as they uh, as they always did back then. Did they always had people in the studio on the phones? Didn't That's they? right. And people were phoning in live. Yeah. And um, and you know, passing it over to Michael Parkinson. Uh, and then we also had Sarah Green, who was a well-known presenter at the time, interacting with the family at the spooky house, who were a mother and her two daughters. Well, you, you've seen this, Tom. What, the, the show begins, well, it's, it's kind of exactly as you'd imagine. It's the family talking about the things that have happened in the house. Yeah. We even get like a little bit of video footage, which has been taken by some paranormal investigators where items fly off the shelves in the girl's bedroom. And uh, there's this brilliant moment when someone calls in on the phone lines and says, you need to replay that footage of the girl's bedroom because there's someone at the back of the room. There's a figure stood by the window. And even saying that now (laughs) gives me goosebumps. It's like it's one of those moments where... uh, you know, it's like 
things from then on start to get creepier and creepier and it properly takes a turn. And what was this uh, very fun, you know, slightly playful TV uh, live ghost watch actually starts becoming quite disturbing. And it was a br- just a brilliant bit of TV. But of course, spoiler alert, it wasn't live. It was all scripted yeah. by today's guest, Stephen Vogt. Yeah. But like 11 million people watched it that night. It was our generation's uh, War of the Worlds, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly, yeah. It was exactly that. It's a proper like legendary bit of TV now. And I think partly because it, it only aired once on terrestrial TV. I don't think well, it's, it's ever of, been... of that time as well, wasn't it? That you kind of watched it and saw it or you missed it. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't an was iPlayer it. to watch it on again or there wasn't... Or to pause yeah, yeah. if you weren't recording on your VHS or Betamax. Yeah. There was no way of watching it again. You were just It was just what was put in front of you. That's it. And it sort of, I think because of that, became sort of mythological, didn't it? And there were videos knocking around. Yeah. And, you know, you could buy them for a lot of money. <laughs> and obviously now you can just stream it on Amazon Prime. But it it, it sort of built a, a huge cult following, partly because it's, it's just really, we- it's really well done. It's really well put together. But it's... Um, also, you know, because it was hard to get hold of, I think, as well. Back in the day, people were more easily scared as well, weren't they? Because I don't That's think it. a ghost called Mr. Pipes would be that scary <laughs> now. <laughs> Always just struck yeah. me as a funny name. Yeah. But it's, if you, yeah, if you, uh, if you have never seen it, you absolutely need to watch it. Yeah. Because it's one of those things that is sort of weirdly almost a bit daft to begin with and not that interesting but then it just grabs you it is it is really a bit of genius yeah and amazing actually that it was made i think well we hear in the interview we hear about that don't we how it nearly didn't or did or bits or how it changed it's how it developed interesting Interesting. but that's not the only guest we've got is it john that is not the only guest we have uh we also have dr kieran o'keefe who you will know from uh, most Haunted. M- most Haunted. You must have seen that. Certainly if you, I don't know, I assume it broadcast mainly in the United Kingdom, but it may be available elsewhere. Um, but again, it's very much a, a ghost hunting paranormal reality television series. And probably massively inspired by Ghostwatch. Oh, it's it's definitely of that. It's like little episodic versions of that, isn't it? Yeah, in a absolutely. way. Uh, where they go to haunted places and they'd be, um, again, a, a, a known presenter in Yvette Fielding, kind of a trusted TV yeah. person, as well as sort of a team of, of ghost hunters and mm. psychics. And they would also take a sceptic who... I was going to say it was played by Kieran, but um, it's not, <laughs> very, is it? It's not played. It's not a character. Very much played by he Kieran. Is. He's very sceptical, but in an open-minded, scientific, but still with an eye on the paranormal kind of way, yeah. I think it's fair to say. Absolutely. He's he's kind of obsessed with ghosts, but he doesn't believe in them. He's a bit, bit like me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, except he's actually studied the psychological phenomenon rather than uh, just enjoying ghost stories. An interesting panel for our discussion today. Uh, I think the idea, in a way, is that we were hoping to talk to them and talk about what makes people scared so that we could write a really great ghost story. So if you're interested in ghost stories, this is a particularly good one. And obviously, it's the right time of year. So let's have a listen. Well, on the show today, we are honoured with the presence of two people who, in a way, have both made their living from ghosts, but in very different ways. We are joined by horror stroke ghost story screenwriter and fiction writer Stephen Voke, and also ghost hunter and doctor of parapsychology Kieran O'Keefe. What a team. (laughs) Uh, Kieran, I feel like we should start with you, partly so that you can explain exactly what it is you do, because I suspect most people probably won't know what a parapsychologist does. Okay. Parapsychology, as a simple definition, is the scientific study of the paranormal. But actually, the paranormal Mm. is vast. It can include anything like Loch Ness Monsters, alien abduction, uh, you know, various forms of cryptozoology and Yeti, you name it. But parapsychologists are only interested in three specific areas. One is ESP, extrasensory perception, which covers things like telepathy. The other one is psychokinesis, the movement of objects with their mind. And the last one is after-death communication, or otherwise called survival. So survival after death. 
and that is my particular area of interest is that survival after death hence being a, a ghostbuster if you will but also a parapsychologist that's yeah. fascinated by ghosts and how does the application of science with something that arguably possibly doesn't massively exist how does that work <laughs> on a day-to-day basis beautifully put, yeah, beautifully put and i love the word massively doesn't exist um it's interesting there's two perspectives so i come at it from a very much a skeptical perspective which means i'm open open open-minded but i am questioning my role and my research is very much about looking at skeptical explanations of people's Mm. haunting and paranormal experiences so for example if somebody says that suggestion which is the the psychological idea that i suggest to you a place is haunted if somebody says that's a good explanation for ghostly experiences in that particular location what i would then do is set up a psychology experiment to test the idea that suggestion can make you have a ghostly experience so that's my perspective it's using science to test these skeptical explanations i see so even as a as a scientist and a skeptic i mean i know that you've been to a lot of spooky places in your time Uh, despite being a skeptic uh have you ever been prone to you know fear of the paranormal or of ghosts or whatever do you know what i mean are you are you kind of, when you're in the most kind of spooky environment, do you feel like it's still, you're still thinking, oh, this does feel a bit strange? Or or are you staying in a, you know, a haunted manor house and just strolling around in your pants, you know, eating crisps <laughs> or whatever? Lo- very that's a lovely out. image, that is. Um, that would spook some people out, I think. <laughs> it would. Um, I, I guess at, at the heart of it, I'm not scared by ghosts. I think it was pretty, right. it was pretty weird for somebody to say that they've devoted their life to investigating ghosts and to listening to people's haunting experiences and kind of approaching the scientific perspective and to be scared by a ghost. If I went into a haunted house and a ghost came up to me and shouted, boo, the last thing I'm going to do is run away because I've devoted my life to researching this sort of stuff. If anything, the ghost is going to be bored to death because I'm going to be asking it questions, I'm going to be taking (laughs) photographs. You know, so no, I don't tend to get scared I have been in haunted locations where I've had odd feelings, where I felt spooked. Mm. So, for example, SS Great Britain walked into the lower class accommodation and I felt spooked, genuinely felt spooked. Um, my wife thinks it's because it was the lower class accommodation, um, but uh, <laughs> but there could be other reasons for it. You know, there could be environmental reasons for it. And I guess that's why I don't tend to get scared like the majority of people in ghostly environments because I'm aware of the natural explanations for what might be going on. Mm. And Stephen, as someone that's obviously been massively involved in in writing about ghosts, what's your level of belief or not belief or where does it sit with you? Um, I think pretty much like uh, Kieran, to be perfectly honest, I am quite sceptical. Um, I leave a kind of sliver, which I think scientists should do, really, in case an explanation or a, a theory that accounts for what people have been experiencing is just around the corner. I mean, let's face it, we can't possibly at a mo- be at a moment in history where everything in science is correct, because yeah. that moment has yeah. never happened yeah, yeah. before in history. So it'd be supremely arrogant to think that we have all the answers <laughs> right now. So if you accept that, as a fact, then there are some things out there that need explaining. And I'm kind of fascinated by the fact that people, I do believe people have these experiences. Um, And I suspect Mm. like Kieran, uh, I think there are multifarious ways of possibly explaining them in the gray areas of psychology, psychodynamics, physics, even like um, geography sometimes or geology (laughs) <laughs> mm. can come into play um so lots of these different disciplines can have an info we are electrical beings in a sense uh and we haven't completely mapped out how that electrical being works in infinitesimal degree so you know question marks are still out there um mm. but i don't think my personal belief in what a ghost is has anything to do with my enjoyment of reading or writing ghost stories and i'd yes. be intrigued i'd be intrigued to know kieran do you enjoy reading ghost stories or ghost films i mean can you separate your kind of day job from just enjoying a ghost story yeah one 100 percent, i can and for two reasons number one 
when I was a boy watching the movie Ghostbusters and deciding that's what I want to do. <laughs> so, you know, I've been fascinated by the, fascinated by the entertainment mm. side, but also as a young boy and an early teenager, I was a voracious reader of, you know, M.R. James, Lovecraft, mm. but also contemporary writers, Clive Barker, for example, some of Stephen King's short stories, James Herbert. So, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoy reading ghost stories. I thoroughly enjoyed watching films too. I suspect like me, sometime probably in your teens when you'd kind of imbibed all those collections of horror stories and ghost stories from Fontana or pan books of horror stories, you know, there started to be a need to read uh, non-fiction about that kind of area. And there were some good yeah. books that came out in paperback about ghost hunters and about um, the history of psychical research, as they called it rather daintily in those days. Uh, and I know for me, it, there was a kind of crossover point where um, my interest in fiction overlapped into my interest in the history of what we now call the paranormal and investigators of the paranormal. And, and, and that, mm. that, that study in itself has always run kind of in parallel with me in a way. Yeah, along with these sort of old photos of, you know, photographic evidence of ghosts. I loved oh, all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the, I think that... The juxtaposition of science and the unexplained is a kind of intoxicating brew for me. Mm. Um, and, you know, part of that, I think, is the core of a lot of things that, that Nigel Neal was um, dramatising. Uh, there were a lot of shows in the 1970s on TV that were kind of ghostbustery type mm. characters. Like, I remember vividly Donald Pleasance playing Karnacki, the ghost finder in an episode of The Rivals of <laughs> yes. Sherlock Holmes. Um, right. And, uh, and it was based on a story called The Horse of the Invisible. It's very, very hokey now. I mean, Donald Pleasance mm. himself is always is, is always good value. But I, I realised watching that quite recently that, uh, you know, some of these things you see in childhood really resonate in your own work without you really being aware mm. where they came from. I mean, there's a whole sequence where Karnaki in, in this drama from, I think, the early 1970s, he sets up his... his um, plate cameras and this kind of thing at night time and trip wires and all the rest of it to kind of catch this <laughs> ghost when they hear the ghostly hoofbeats in the night, you know, that kind of thing. And I realised that some of these images have, have kind of found their way in my own stories. Yeah. Almost. I mean, what you're saying there almost sounds like the kind of the seed or the core of the idea behind Ghost Watch in a way. It's, you know, yeah, very I mean, much that idea, isn't it? All the way through, the idea of technology trying to catch a ghost or trying to explain a ghost and kind of not being able to, I think, I think that it represents in a way the two sides of human nature. One is to explain things and to make things rational and to pin things down and to analyse them. And the mm. other side of our nature is a more terrified and vulnerable state, which is drawn to a story that has no explanation. And I think that's the frisson that I get when science butts up against the supernatural mm. in, a, in a story. Having mentioned Ghostwatch there, Stephen, I just wanted to ask you, obviously it was 30 years ago, but um, I'm just interested from a, a writer's perspective, can you remember much about how that story developed did it start out as a as a kind of standard ghost story or did it begin with the the sort of the concept of uh you know a live outside broadcast and then go from there um, um it started actually as a as a drama series about a um as i say psychical investigator that's mm. that's investigating a poltergeist uh, house actually it was a block of flats to begin with mm. uh and they become involved with a tv crew that's making a documentary right and it was it was really structured as a six-part drama series okay. um in a, in a conventional sense and i had various subplots about i think an esp researcher and um, all sorts of things fell by the wayside but the final episode of the six-part series was always going to be a live broadcast from this haunted flat in this right okay. in this tower block so eventually the producer ruth baumgarten said to me look the bbc are not gonna they're not gonna finance a six our supernatural series they're just not going to do it this was the late 80s and the bbc weren't interested in supernatural at that point uh and she said but do you think we could do it as a 90 minute special for screen one because there was a slot on i think it was mm. usually a sunday night actually although we eventually did it on saturday 
if we could do it in 90 minutes, I think we could get it off with uh, screen one. Mm. And I said, well, I don't think we can do the whole thing in 90 minutes, but why don't we just do the last episode? And the rest of the story is kind of flashback, really, or just backstory. And she immediately, I think, even without having that conversation, knew that there was the potential there to create a kind of War of the Worlds scenario where mm. we're pretending something's mm. uh, real and it isn't for real. And that's really how it started. And it really was. It had that War of the Worlds, people getting the wrong end of the stick, people falling in, clogging up the switchboards to the BBC. That's right. I mean, I regret in a way that, I always say this, but when we were working on it, we never used the word hoax. To us, it it really was a drama yeah. that needed to be mm. done a certain way to be effective, you know. And it wasn't a prank, you know. You don't use a chunk of BBC drama budget for a, <laughs> a kind of April Fool. You know, that wasn't our attitude. It, it was just mm. to be done a certain yeah. way. And obviously we thought to make it effective, we mm. had to make certain decisions, and that was to... First of all, to do it on video, not to do it on 16 mil, to use real presenters, you mm. know, and everything I put into writing it really was not conventional screenwriting. It wasn't conventional three act structure or anything like that. I was really yeah. using scenes that were imitating, imitating the milieu of live broadcast and uh, outside, outside yeah. broadcast interview techniques and that kind of thing. As sleight of hand to a certain extent, really. Using Michael Parkinson is, <laughs> I think, an absolute stroke yeah, of yeah. genius. Because he was, I mean, he's just the voice of authority and, I mean, it's, you know, comp just one of the most trustworthy people on, on television. <laughs> and he's amazing in it as well. He's absolutely <laughs> incredible, isn't he? Well, I think what, what the unexpected bonus of using him was, I think, the fact he has a kind of uh, Yorkshire kind of bluntness, which makes the whole enterprise... Mm. A sceptical one, really. And uh, even though he's got empathy to a certain extent, you know, to people he interviews, which is the other side of him, uh, yeah. when things go wrong, he becomes more and more Barnsley, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that, 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 I think, is, that I think is rather wonderful. And, and also, to his credit, he, he got it immediately. He didn't need any persuasion or explanation about what this was or mm. what it was trying to do. I mean... You have to remember that he presented a program called Cinema for many years. He knew all about movies and all about horror movies. Mm. He knew how they worked and he got what the piece was potentially aiming to do, be scary and also kick mm. the media in the ribs at the same time, which which was our other intention, you know. Kieran, do you remember your thoughts on Ghostwatch as it happened just over just over 30 years ago now which is mental i do yeah i do but i wasn't in the country in 1992 ah. when it was originally broadcast i was in america at the time studying parapsychology so ah. i didn't catch it when it was live broadcast but i did catch it later on i think the summer when i mm. oh, no it was christmas time when i came back to the uk and enthralled by it and stephen knows a, a, a huge fan and a, and a huge fan because of recognizing the influence of that one show since then. I mean, it's been huge. I presented at a conference mm -hmm. a few years ago, almost tracing the influence that Ghostwatch had on paranormal media since. Right. You know, and I was part of the show Most mm -hmm. Haunted. Yeah. And that's a classic example of almost a textbook copy of of how Ghostwatch was presented. You yeah. know, it was a the, the live shows had a presenter in a studio and there was a skeptic sat next to the presenter. They would then cut back to the team, which was the lead investigator, who was the presenter, who was an ex Blue Peter presenter, ironically, and then the medium and then an investigator or skeptic with them. I mean, it feels to an extent as though when Most Haunted was developed, it, they had been watching Ghostwatch <laughs> and thought, how can we do this for real? And I'm doing mm. that in inverted commas. Um, you can't see me doing that. But, but <laughs> it, it's that influence. It's then if you look at paranormal media since it's had a huge influence. And also the you know, recognition of how big that influence is, is recently Stephen and I were at the Horror Show, which was a special exhibition about the influence of horror mm. put together by Ian and Jane, two artists. And Ghostwatch was a, a big feature, had its own room <laughs> So, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan anyway, but also, like I said, because of that influence and that yeah. kind of long-standing influence that it's had. It seems unfair, really, that Ghostwatch got a six, mm. uh, six-parter series turned down and Most Haunted did over 300 episodes. 
<laughs> Disappointing uh, is a word. <laughs> Which I, I suppose that's often the case, though, isn't it, with a forerunner? It's something that kind of puts the groundwork in. Often it doesn't actually get recognised until later on anyway. So, Well, you know, uh, when you're doing something, you don't think of legacy. Or, yeah, or, yeah. or you don't think how people will think of it 30 years down the line. You think, if only we, we get to make this, you know. It was touch <laughs> yes. and go all yeah. the way up to actually beginning to film mm-hmm. it. I mean, yeah. Leslie, the director, for instance, took a massive gamble in putting uh, pumpkin heads and uh, decorations for Halloween because they hadn't confirmed when it was going to go out. So wow. she kind of just right. just did it on, on the presumption that they would have yeah, to, yeah. you know. But even the day before, somebody said, unless you put the writer's name at the beginning of this, we're not going to transmit it. Really? And, uh, Ruth, Ruth had to go right. back in the uh, editing room, even though it was all picture locked, and put my name at the beginning. It's kind of blink and you miss it, deliberately so. Yeah. But it was they would have they would have pulled it the day before if she hadn't done that. So wow. then again, I mean, even though they stood in its way so many ways, where they said no, we can't have real presenters; they have to be actors pretending to be presenters. I mean, you know, they stood <laughs> in the way of anything that would make it work and didn't really understand what it was going to be. I mean, Richard Brooke, the executive producer didn't understand why we didn't want to shoot it on 16 mil. He didn't understand why we couldn't use uh, music. You know, we couldn't, obviously we couldn't use composed music because that kind of thing doesn't have composed (laughs) music. But he didn't get it. He admitted later on in the documentary we we made that he was completely wrong. He didn't understand what we were doing and none of them did really. Uh, Again, Michael Parkinson said in the documentary Behind the Curtains that uh, Rich Lord and um, directed a very good documentary about behind the scenes and the aftermath of Ghost Watch. Parkinson said, you have to remember that the BBC did actually make it in the end. You know, they did actually mm. do it. Um, so without the BBC, it may never have happened. So so we've got to be grateful to a certain extent. Yeah, and I think it's probably true uh, back then that it being on the BBC gave it extra gravitas, didn't it, in terms of that believability? Mm. Well, that was very important for me, really. And people have said afterwards, uh, you know, couldn't you have done it on Channel 4? And I don't think it would have had the same impact on Channel 4. No. It wouldn't. Because Channel 4 is kind of a naughty cousin, whereas uh, yeah, BBC yeah. is kind of an auntie mm. that you rely on for wartime broadcasts and State of the Nation and uh, that kind of thing. And the fact that this thing that you were told to trust was the national broadcaster, you know, made it even more subversive, I think, in a way. And of course, there was a, I, was just, I was just about to say, Stephen, there's the legacy as well of following, you know, amazing, you said about Nigel Neal, Stone Tape. Yeah. That was a BBC play, yeah. wasn't it? But that was a, a drama. But, you know, it's a huge legacy in terms of the BBC, in terms of getting these things to air and having these uh, um, amazing shows like Stone Tape, which is also very influential. The, the fact that the Stone Tape is a phrase that is now part of the Ghost Hunter narrative. Yeah. You hear Ghost Hunters talk about it and forgetting that it goes back to a 1970, you know, uh, Nigel Neal BBC play. Mm. I wanted to talk about the the psychology of ghosts and ghost stories. Stephen, you pointed out in one of your essays that in a lot of horror or a lot of horror features, the question of whether people are going mad or not, and it's kind of a well established theme of horror, isn't it? That that question of whether an experience has a, a supernatural explanation or whether it's connected more to a psychological flaw or that's even right, madness. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I'd be interested uh, as to what Kieran thinks of this, but mm. in, in the kind of film criticism world, there's this theorist called uh, Todorov uh, who wrote about what he called the fantastic, but what we would understand more as the uncanny, I suppose, um, mm. although that's kind of Freudian theory. But let's call it the uncanny because the fantastic means lots of different things. Um And Todorov had this idea of if you have a kind of supernatural experience, he said, you're on a kind of tightrope. In that moment where you see something inexplicable, you're faced with two unpalatable possibilities. One is ghosts exist. Therefore, everything I think about the real world Hmm. is untrue. Okay. The only other possibility is that that ghost is not there and I'm actually going mad which Mm. is also unpalatable, okay? So what he says in that moment where you're experiencing that, you're having this kind of frisson 
or what would you say, a kind of duality of, of feelings, mm. a fluctuation between these two unwanted explanations. Mm. Uh, and that to me, that struck me as psychologically convincing. And I've always borne it in mind whether it's true or not psychologically or not in terms of people's experiences. I, I don't know, but but it seemed true in terms of my constructing fictional experiences mm. uh, because it felt real that if you were to come across something that you couldn't uh, dismiss, then it seems logical that you think, am I going crazy? Is that really there? And I, I've found that the element of doubt, if you like, um, of what you're experiencing is a, is a very powerful tool in writing a ghost story. In fact, mm. if you write a ghost story and you don't have an element of doubt, somehow it's not convincing. Yeah. It may be convincing as another kind of story, for instance, a fantasy, but not convincing in a ghost story. You know, it, mm. it, Blythe Spirit, you know, the Noel Coward is all about ghosts, but mm. it's kind of comedy. Nobody really disputes that the ghosts are, are there. They never have an element of doubt about mm. ghosts existing. And it works perfectly well as a comedy, but it doesn't really work as a ghost story because fundamentally a ghost story as I understand it, is something that um, kind of disturbs the status quo in terms of the comfort of the reader mm. or the viewer. And that is to do with the operation of that doubt and how, you know, and that becomes a very curious game you have to play and explore <laughs> as a writer because how long can you actually string out that doubt? Yeah. If you think of Night of the Demon... That's a perfect example where you actually see the demon in the first shot, like attacking someone and tearing them apart with its claws. Then you introduce the skeptical character, and the skeptical character doesn't believe in any of these things. And and you're like, but I've just seen, I've just <laughs> seen this demon. Um, so the skeptical character doesn't kind of hold much water because of what you've already seen. So the balance between a, uh, a character having doubt about what they experience or, or what they're involved in in a story and uh, what the audience sees and knows is a very difficult balance to um, construct in mm. terms of the structure of a story. Because if you keep the scary thing off stage too long, the audience is going to get bored. If you show yeah. too much too early, you've got to then top it, which is mm. why it's very difficult to achieve a ghost story over a kind of feature length film. Yeah. It's really, really tricky in remaining subtle yeah and that that is why in my opinion in the last five years or so hardly any ghost stories uh succeed in remaining subtle all the way through they tend to mm. even the good ones tend to go berserk in the last act because they lose the, lose the courage of their convictions and just throw everything plus the kitchen sink at the wall yeah. you know i was just going to ask that actually then about about kind of the final act in the end with that balance all the way through it is incredibly difficult not just to have some kind of anticlimax at the end Maybe that's why yeah, they, lean, they lean towards that, having some massive supernatural shootout at the end is the easy option, inverted commas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, probably the, the classic good example of um, playing your, your cards close to your chest is probably Alien. I know it's not a ghost story, but you don't see very much until... Mm. You don't mm. even even see very much towards the end, to be perfectly honest. Uh, you, you kind of think now that you do, because in subsequent films you've seen a lot more of the Alien. But when it first mm. came out, you you actually saw very little. So your, your brain had to uh, conjure up or kind of imagine what this destructive alien was mm. um, that you hadn't seen much of. Um, Which is always much worse yeah. than the thing that you actually see eventually. Yeah, It takes a steady nerve to, to keep it off screen, though. That's the thing. Mm. That's why the short stories, I don't know what Kieran thinks, but the short stories that were adapted in like half an hour or sometimes sometimes 40 minutes on if it was an ITV slot in the 70s, often work really well because you probably only need to deliver one or two moments in that 40 minutes if you've got the right build-up. Mm. Um, and you don't have to keep topping it, you know. Mm. It's very tricky. It's very tricky. In fact, it's so tricky, yeah. I wonder why I keep doing it. It's just so impossible. To, <laughs> it's, it's virtually impossible to do, you know. And, people, and if, you, if you fail... Just which, keep cracking on until you get it right, Stephen. It's fine. <laughs> but... But you always fail, you know, you always fail. Someone yeah. says, oh, you read reviews of films that say, oh, that's obvious, that's 
you know, that was hokey, that was terrible, or nothing happens, or that's boring. I mean, I tend to like films that are boring. I'd rather I come away from a film that just slightly spooks me yeah. and is slow, rather than something that throws all the pizza at the wall and, yeah. uh, and just is the same as the last film yeah. you saw. A, a good example where that happens is one called Winchester, I think it's called. I don't know if any of you have seen that. It's based on... Yes. Uh, it's, uh, Kieran probably knows about the Winchester house, which is a true yep. haunted house where the Winchester family come from. And, and supposedly it's haunted by all the people that have been killed by Winchester rifles, which is a brilliantly absurd <laughs> idea. But I, I love the absurdity of it. And um, the first kind of half hour, 40 minutes, you know, is really quite good. And I love the uh, uh, kind of psychodynamics of the atmosphere and the old uh, matriarch of the of the family is um Helen Mirren and uh, some good actors in it and then and then it becomes this kind of ghost train ride you know i know it's a cliche but but they always descended to this kind of you know running through locked rooms and uh, figures swooping down through the cobwebs and all the rest of it and you know the stuff yeah. and uh, <laughs> and it's just a, a kind of being terrified that the audience is going to lose interest, and uh, there are directors out there that are that are wonderful. I love certainly the early films of Mike Flanagan. Like um, Oculus was pretty good, but Absentia before that was even better. And um, Oz Perkins as well is is a brilliantly subtle uh, director. There definitely are directors out there more on the art house edges that that mm. yeah you know that kind of refuse this call to <laughs> call to action literally call to action more and more action more and more kind of gore and zombie effects and every mm. every face that looms at a window has to look like uh, the girl from The Exorcist you know and that kind of thing and I just I'm just like oh please mm. I've seen that so many times I was going to say it's lovely hearing this from a writer's perspective. Perspective, you know, because I think about the same thing in my world, and it's what it's what you're talking about. M. R. James called, you know, said for it to succeed, it needs to be a nicely managed crescendo. Yeah, which is exactly what you're saying in terms of that kind of story arc. And I see it for my sins most weekends. You'll find me in a haunted house or haunted location with amateur ghost hunters doing their thing. Now, if they have a if they have a big jump scare at the very beginning of the evening. They get very, very excited and they go, oh, it's going to be a brilliant night. It's going to be, you know, if they hear a door slam, oh, it's going to be amazing. But the whole night becomes a disappointment because they've started <laughs> yeah, off with yeah. something quite big. The best ghost hunts that I've seen where the punters come away really excited about the location and really excited about their evening has been where maybe the first two hours, nothing mm. happens. Absolutely nothing happens. They're sitting in the dark. They're asking out questions or they're mm. doing a Ouija board and nothing really happens. There's kind of the implicit expectation something mm. is going to happen, even if that takes hours. And then something does happen, you know, two hours into the night. And it can be a big thing. It could be, uh, you know, a door slamming. It could be somebody hearing footsteps. It could be the planchette moving on a Ouija board. Something happens. And suddenly that night becomes amazing for people. But it has mm. to have that nicely managed crescendo and going back to what Stephen was saying about the film idea that that you have somebody who has a paranormal experience and they're either thinking ghosts are real or they're thinking mm. that they're going mad that's a again a lovely thing to hear from a writer's perspective because um i get the same sense and i've never thought about it this way but when i'm talking to people about their ghostly experiences people tend to have that reaction in reality, when they're telling me about their experience. So they'll think it's a ghost and they're trying to convince me mm. it's a ghost, but then I'll give a psychological explanation for it. I'll say, well, you know, if you want an explanation for it, it sounds as though it's the perfect kind of environment for you to have sleep paralysis. Mm. And I explain about sleep paralysis and I explain, you know, you had this ghostly experience, you saw this thing at the end of the bed, but actually, you're asleep, your eyes opened, you still had dream imagery going on in your head, but you felt paralyzed, mm. you know, and, it, and, it, and it's very disconcerting and very panicky. But even explaining that to somebody and saying it's a perfectly natural explanation, people's immediate reaction is they think that there's yeah. something wrong yeah. with them. Even when confronted mm. with a skeptic like myself, who is genuinely very diplomatic mm. about explaining people's experiences we'll only do it if somebody asks me for an explanation that's a lot less fun than i imagined it might be 
that you would just be going around going, hold on a minute, sunshine. Come on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. You're mad. So I am diplomatic, but even, even when I explain to people, look, auditory hallucinations that happen late at night, when we're kind of in between that, that state of sleeping and, and waking, those auditory hallucinations happen to like 70% of us at one mm. time in our life. Even if I say that, and say it's a very common experience, people will still think, but well, there's something wrong with me. What, what triggered that? And I think that's fascinating. Yeah. There's a strange paradox, isn't there? Because on the one hand, we're all desperate to see a ghost I mean, because it would be amazing. And there are reasons for that, I think. You know, the, the fact that it's nice to think that death isn't the end and things like that. But at the same time, we're also terrified by the idea. So it's a really interesting kind of paradox. It, sort, it reminds me, um, it reminds me, Kieran, you, you famously exposed uh, Derek Akora, oh, the, yeah. the TV spiritualist, by, um, I think you had, whether you had someone kind of feed him some false names of people that had supposedly died in this building. Yeah. And then he would do his usual thing of, you know, kind of becoming a vessel for that spirit and speaking the words as if possessed. But uh, unfortunately, the the name of the spirit, uh, he said, was speaking through him, was Creed Kafer or something, which was an anagram of Derek Faker. That's right, yes. Bodmin but, Jail of all places. Which we fully commend because that is exactly the kind of thing we would do. Karen. No, uh, without, a doubt, without a doubt. <laughs> but my question would be, with someone like Derek, how far do you think he was, you know, de like deliberately taking advantage of people? Or do you think he actually believed, do you know what I mean, that he had the ability to channel the spirit world or whatever? I think it's a, it, an interesting question. And I think you have to separate two approaches in mediumship. Mm. So Derek claiming to be a medium, there are two platforms in which mm. he would have been working. One is in a haunted context. Mm. So on a TV show, supposedly communicating with spirit, there's a totally different platform in which Derek and other mediums across the country work. And that is when they are, they are in theatres yeah. yeah. or in spiritualist churches as well. But that's a different kind of religious mm. question there. But in, in theatres, they're giving readings to people. Now, that whole side of things, I would say, look, the majority of mediums that I've interacted with over my 30, 40 years of researching mm. this stuff makes me believe that they genuinely think that they are communicating mm. with spirit. And yet, actually, when you hear the readings that they give to people, you can say quite confidently, but they're not. They're not actually communicating mm. with spirit. There's some simple psychology mm. going on. We talk about cold reading, this idea of yeah. being able to pick up on cues if you're you know, face to face with somebody that I think the majority genuinely believe they're communicating with spirit. They don't understand these processes and they don't understand how over the years they've almost kind of perfected the art of cold reading without mm -hmm. realizing it's cold reading. So that's one side of things. With mediums involved in mm. investigation, you've also got an interesting difference there when you look at the UK versus North America. In the UK, generally, ghost hunters and people that will follow mediums around in a haunted location, they're quite sceptical in a way, mm. and they require kind of detailed information from the medium. The issue I have with that is that there is a perfect opportunity to do research in advance. <laughs> of course, yeah. yeah. Perfect opportunity. You know exactly where you're going, and it's whether it's a TV show or whether it's a public mm. ghost hunt, it doesn't matter. But again, you will find those mediums regurgitating some of the research and elaborating yeah. and extrapolating and sensationalizing some of that information and giving it a, mo a very emotive release when they talk about the girl that said to haunt the castle and they'll they'll speak in the voice of the girl for example mm. or talk about her emotion so they'll elaborate and they become lovely storytellers in that respect yeah, yeah. You know, and for some of them they genuinely believe that but others they might be out and out deliberate mm. fr frauds and there is money to be made in this let's, yeah, not, yeah. let's not forget that but there is a, a real mix that i mentioned about america just as a little aside mm. having done lots of ghost hunts in america totally different audience Whereas in the UK, people are after dates, names, why is this mm. ghost here, all of that sort of thing. In America, you can be following a medium around and they can go, I feel very sad in here. <laughs> Something bad has happened. And that's it. Boom. They don't even have to say another word. 
purely emotional. They never, yeah, they yeah. rarely have to come up with dates and names to convince the audience that they're actually communicating the spirit. So if you want, if you want a gig as a medium, you say in America is a much easier market. I am genuinely <laughs> yeah. saying that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask, um, I don't know if this is going to be an awkward question or not. So the, the outing and unveiling of Derek Cora, why did that happen? What, what was the reason behind you being a cheeky little scamp? Well, everybody refers to that particular incident, but you need to rewind to the first first couple of episodes that I was involved with. And, and the reason why, you know, that general kind of unveiling, is a lovely way of putting it, happened, is because my, the very, very first few episodes I was involved in, Parcel Leslie, where Derek touched a four-poster bed and came up with an incredible amount of detail about this particular bed, who had slept in it, who owned it, where it had been before the castle. Yes, it's an entertainment show, and maybe I should take you know a step back and acknowledge that. But on the other hand, I was also very conscious that people believed what mediums mm. were saying in paranormal TV shows. Yes, yeah, there's a responsibility there. Yeah, you know, I said just out of interest where did you get all the information from did it you know is it research that you've done beforehand and now you're contacting and communicating with spirit or touching the bed and it's confirming all of this information is it the spirit telling you these things is it the ether and he said no no no. when i walked in i got a you know flash of all of this information coming through and then when i touched the bed a lot more detail came flooding through all the information 100 percent accurate the wrong bed it was totally the wrong bed. The actual four-poster bed was in a completely different part of the castle. Uh, and that's what I found. Fat- um, I, immediately I went, okay. The ghosts were playing a prank. Is that what you were saying? So it was, all, it was spiritual, but the ghosts were having... Yeah, they moved the bed yeah. down. Yeah, the ghosts, the ghosts were playing. That was a, that's a lovely yeah. out there. That would have been a lovely out. Um, but yeah, seeing that very early on, I just thought, yeah, it's not right. But also, yeah, I recognise it's a bit of entertainment, but if you continue the claim that you're not doing research and finding out information beforehand, then that mm. also doesn't sit right. Mm. So it, it needs some sort of exposing, as I have done with loads of other mediums. Were you a lone wolf on this, or was it with the blessing of the production team? Or? No, there was no there was no blessing, there wow. was no knowledge at all that this was happening. And I've done similar things um, actually on BBC with mediums on other shows. And it's really, people have said to me afterwards, oh, but I got this amazing reading from Derek yeah. when I uh, yeah. saw him on platform in Spiritualist Church or in a theatre in Liverpool, that sort of thing. And I said, well, there's nothing I can say about that. It was your reading. You were impressed by it. You say it's highly accurate. I wasn't there. We don't have a recording of it. So I'm not going to take anything away from it. But in those instances where, because of the being set up, we can show that he wasn't genuinely communicating with spirit. Mm. If because of that, you are now doubting mediumship and you're questioning it, then I've succeeded. Mm. And that's really all it was about, is kind of raising doubt about the authenticity and accuracy of a medium on a TV show. Thank you for listening to the Failing Writers Podcast. If you like what you hear, make sure you're all subscribed and following and what have you. We'd hate for you to miss out on any of this amazing content. Well, let's get back to some real ghosts now, okay? Um, Because I've got a question for both of you. I want to know what your favourite ghost story is. Uh, Kieran, I'm guessing you've heard a lot of... um, in inverted commas, real ghost stories. Have you got a like a particular favourite or one that you remember more than the others? That's a really tough one because I've heard so many. Mm. Obviously, there are loads in fiction. Like I said, M.R. James and Clive Barker, his books of blood and mm. some of the horror ghost stories in there I'm fascinated by. I guess um, the creepiest thing for me about any ghost story, whether it's fiction or whether it's on a movie or Mm. when people report it is, it's going to seem weird, but it's that uncanny element that that Stephen was talking about, that unsettling kind of oddly familiar thing is when a child's toy starts moving or starts working Mm. in the middle of the night. Yeah, that's a good one. And there was, there was a particular ghost story that I've heard actually quite recently of a young boy getting uh, uh, one of these old Fisher-Price 
phones, you know, the oh, ones yeah, with yeah, the yeah, dial yeah, on yeah, it where you yeah, where you yeah. turn the dial and then it rings. Yeah, we had one. Yeah. Um, and um, it started to ring in the middle of the night. <laughs> it's freaky. Even just saying that now, that's freaky. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's just cool. and genuinely freaked out by it. But but then the story then has this lovely managed crescendo, even though it's a it's a true story, where it starts off with that. And the parents thinking, oh, it, it's fine. You know, it's just a little glitch in the toy. But then it builds to the boy then reporting that when the phone rings, he picks it up and he can hear a voice. <laughs> Which, of course, you can't on these old Fisher Price toys. Yeah. But it's some, it's something about the That's child's wonderful. toy, mm. you know, and you see it used in some um, some ghost movies. And it's a lovely one. Because it's, a, it's something that should be safe. It's a toy for a child. But it's that oddly familiar aspect that for any parent, you'll know that it's happened. It's mm. happened with me with various toys that have just gone off in the middle of the night. Yeah. And my wife and I lying there going, right, who's going to go and investigate that? And just because you can hear the exact sound of it in your head as well. And you know how how scary yes. and freaky that and confusing that would be to hear at three o'clock in the morning. Exactly. And mm. then imagine when you pick up the receiver and it's Derek Akora from the other side. Asking for Kieran. <laughs> Getting his own back. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Stephen, Stephen, what about um, you? Are, you? are you asking me for true ghost stories or just my favourite ghost stories? I think for you, I think we, we need to hand over to fiction. Um, okay. I would say off the top of my head, uh, The Signal Man, Charles Dickens. Oh, you know, I've never read that. Um, it, it was a... Um, it was a really superb ghost story for Christmas on the BBC with Denham Elliott. Mm. I love the whole series, uh, which they obviously did every every Christmas for a number of years. But I think it's the standout one because it's just simply the best story. Mm. And it was years after I saw the TV version that I actually sat down and uh, because someone asked me to introduce it at a at a convention, I thought oh, I better read the actual story. But it's a it's an absolutely brilliant, concise story. And, you know, the the story around it is quite fascinating, how it was inspired by Dickens being uh, involved in the Staplehurst uh, train crash. And, uh, you know, I often think it's kind of interesting in relationship to technology, you know, the fact that in Victorian times, you know, uh, railways were advanced technology. It was kind yeah, of like people, yeah, yeah. like we think of AI now, it's kind of like they didn't know where that technology was going to end up. You know, they thought... 40 mile an hour trains were were you know against god really or certainly no no good would come of it kind of thing sorry i digress it's just a brilliant story um and uh, definitely one of my favorites okay great we'll give that a read tom and i are actually going to have a go at writing a ghost story for the podcast because we we tend to give each other little challenges little tasks and um, we're thinking may, we might read them out in our uh, christmas episode in true victorian tradition but I'd really like to just end by talking about what are the ingredients of a really great story? You know, if we're to build the structure of a, a great ghost story now, how do we do it? As an expert on the writing side, Stephen, and an expert on people's psychology, Kieran, we should be out of work this out. <laughs> we, should have the, we should have the absolute gold standard here, shouldn't we, if we combine the two? Yeah. I think one of the things that uh, I always say in relation to Ghost Watch, funnily enough, is that, um, you know, if you read a classic ghost story, it normally starts off by saying, I'm about to tell you something that really did happen to me. You're not going to believe it. Mm, yes. You're going to doubt it. You're going to say I'm mad, but it really, really did happen to me. And here it is. Yeah. It's like the urban myth yeah. thing, isn't it? It's a, this happened to a friend of a friend of mine or whatever. Yeah. But also there's a lovely start as well, which I get a lot, which is I was a skeptic. Yeah, the power of someone being converted, yeah. Yeah, and of course, what I was looking to do in Ghostwatch was ask myself, what is the television equivalent of that ghost story that says, no, this really did happen to me? Um, mm. Which led me to think, no, it's a camera in your face, and you're saying to the camera, no, this really did happen to me. So it was finding a visual equivalent of a, of a, of a literary trope in a way. The other thing I would say to think of is who's telling the story, who's telling the story and the voice of the story mm. and their attitude to what's in it. And also, you know, a lot of ghost stories have a good sense of place, very specific sense of place. In fact, so you can actually have a ghost story yeah. that's little more than the sense of place. I've read several excellent ones that are 
kind of just about the place. Um, so I'd bear that in mind. It's interesting that the sense of place thing, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, actually, you can you can literally set a ghost story anywhere because it's almost like any location works to a certain extent because familiarity can be great because it kind of lulls you into a, a false sense of security like the house in ghost watch you know it's just a, it's just a pretty boring suburban house but you can also set it in a you know an eerie kind of i don't know an old castle or something which puts you on edge immediately potentially but the uh, the ghost doesn't necessarily have to come from the place um it could come from the person for instance, um, mm. one of the best, I think, supernatural British supernatural films of the last couple of years was called His House. Uh, and it was about um, a couple of immigrants setting up house. And I won't give away any spoilers, but it's really to do with the, the people's backstory than it is about anything inherent in the place where they're living so people mm. carry their ghosts with them which which also brings me to i think for me the most important thing about ghost stories is the relationship between the person doing the experiencing and the ghost itself i mean basically i'm not that interested in the ghost in a ghost story um mm. it's got to be mm. it's it's got to be somehow a projection psychological projection of the character it's the character doing the experiencing that's the important thing yeah because that's what that's what gives you the story i mean very many ghost stories are just i went to this place it was a bit weird i saw this weird thing end of story and it's if something's well written it could just be that but the story that's that go beyond that i think are ones that it's the old cliche of why is this story happening to that person what is it mm. about this person that makes this thing happen on that day at that time? And I'm not saying that should be a great character arc or a massive conclusion of some backstory or anything like that, but why then and why them, yeah. I would ask yourself in a, in a way, because that really is the most important thing. And I find even if I've got an idea for a ghost story, unless I've got an idea of the person at the at the centre of it, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't really kind of come alive. Yeah, and you're right, it should, they should connect up in some way i think in coffee makers blues you say that the ghost represents the flaw in the protagonist and one of my favorite ever ghost stories is turn of the screw and that's a really great example isn't it it's where you've you have this uh, the governess yeah um kind of represents you know a kind of sexual repression yeah. and the, and the this like intense fear of a loss of innocence and that's effectively what you know what the ghosts are if you like it's absolutely kind of her manifestation of the ghosts yeah it's a that's a good example I, I should point out that that's probably one of my favorite ghost stories on film as well the innocence is is absolutely remarkable film um yeah i've never seen that i really want to see that it's really great don't look at any other version other than the one um that made in 1963 in black and white you've got to watch that one it's right. really and let me do let me know what you think it's it's one of my uh, I think after Don't Look Now is my favourite film. Um, but, oh, that's uh, a great film. Uh, yeah. yeah, really, really, really recommend that. I always think in um, there's a moment in every ghost story where you get you know you get the goosebumps and you have that um, it's almost like a physiological reaction to the ghost or to something and it qu it's quite often I think in a ghost story it's a moment when the main character finds out after the fact that they've been in very close proximity to a ghost or something malevolent. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like it's the moment when they realise <laughs> they were right next to something. Does that make sense? But they're finding out afterwards, and it's that shiver down the spine of, oh, my God, that wasn't what I thought it was. It was actually a ghost or it was something else. And that seems to be a trope that comes up time and time again and also in... Um, in urban myths as well, but like the disturbed bedclothes in um, Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, and stuff like that. It's it's the realization afterwards somehow that's more powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the it's the foreboding that happens. It's that kind of signal of something worse that's about to happen. But it's only afterwards, on retrospect, mm. looking in hindsight, looking back and going, oh, yeah, that was something. But at the time, 
the reader or the person watching the movie or the person listening to the story sees that foreboding. They see there's something weird there, mm. but the character doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One thing that I think is uh, really strong, and uh, I certainly go back to from time to time, is uh, the sense that when someone has a kind of supernatural experience, it kind of isolates them. They become not only the doubt that they've got internally about what they may have experienced, but the doubt that's applied mm. towards them from the outside world. So they kind of they're the only person that's carrying this information, yes. and uh, everyone everyone around them says, "Oh, don't be silly," or that kind of thing. And and that kind of um, that in turn is is quite good for breeding kind of paranoia and also a great motivation for them to somehow prove something and find out more. You know, so that can be a good. Uh, engine for the ghost story really in a way brilliant um Stephen, i really want to ask you about uh b- before we let you go i really want to ask you about your new book because you have a book about to come out in fact when this does actually go out which is i think like the day before halloween it it might even be out yeah sure it's called um the good unknown and other ghost stories and i wanted to put together a collection of ghost stories i mean i've had collections of of a variety of of stories in the past but i wanted specifically to have a book of ghost stories just to kind of see what my output of ghost stories kind of looked like together Mm. and to give a kind of overview of the way that i i think about this kind of subgenre and what I've kind of done with it over the years. Um, and there are three new stories in there and various older ones. There's the um, mm-hmm. there's the sequel I did to Ghost Watch, which is called 3110, which I wrote about mm. 20 years ago, I think. There are some period stories, uh, one of which actually, funny we were talking about it, but one of which features uh, Charles Dickens as a character. All right. Brilliant. But mainly contemporary ones. And... Um, Mm. One uh, is a sequel to the TV series Afterlife, um, picking up on the character of Alison Mundy, who was a psychic medium, the main character in the series. Uh, And I suddenly felt a couple of years ago, actually during uh, lockdown, what's she up to? Is she still living in Bristol? What's what's she Mm. doing? How do you feel about reading us a short extract? from the book to give us a little flavor maybe of uh, the start of one of the stories or yes absolutely i'm happy to do that um oh, fantastic i approached clarkenwell films and they said they gave me permission to write it as a novella so it's um it's quite a mm. substantial story that that is the backbone of this of the book but um it really picks up on alison mundy at the end of lockdown i would say really so i'll, I'll read a couple of pages if that's right. all right with you brilliant yeah thank you it's called um lost loved ones she was grateful for the easing of restrictions but still well aware of the rules she shouldn't visit if she felt unwell or displayed symptoms which is okay she didn't nevertheless she hooked a mask behind her ears before entering the building out of respect to the dead and bereaved if nothing else it broke her heart that so many families not so long ago had been forbidden from seeing their loved ones in their last days and hours it seemed horribly unnaturally cruel but of course totally necessary at the time to halt the spread of the virus. Though she read recently that COVID cases were still rising in the UK, it hadn't gone away because we just decided not to think about it much, and that scared her, just like it scared everyone else but the terminally hard of thinking. Once inside the sliding doors, she went to the sanitation station and squirted gel on her hands, still disoriented from disrupted sleep as she tried to remember directions to Ward 12. She should know she'd been there often enough, but her brain was foggy, half-baked. Sometimes she thought she was losing it. Sometimes she thought she had Alzheimer's. But she'd always been bad with directions, no ability to create a mental map, still had trouble with left and right to this day. A blip in the brain, probably. One of many, some would say. The arrow pointed up. She headed for the lift and prodded the core button. The desk was unmanned, but a couple of nurses were busy doing tasks for patients. Not wishing to interrupt them, Alison looked up at a moth fluttering around a fluorescent strip of lighting. She wondered what the life expectancy of moths might be, striving for the light, trying not to be burned, incinerated. Didn't we all? She recognised a diminutive SRN who approached her, peeling off rubber gloves. Extraordinary sculpted eyebrows. It was a thing now. Alison had met her when she'd volunteered in April 2020, helping with the vaccination programme, part of the Bring Back Staff scheme instigated by the South West region of the NHS. 
Her father lay dead and peaceful in the hospital bed, but she only saw him as a man stripped of dignity and fight, skin sallow as parchment from the yellow of his organs packing in, the pot belly that went with kidney failure, him going on for weeks, months without eating or going to the toilet. She always stupidly thought that when he'd go it'd be alcohol-related, even though he'd kicked the booze into touch forty-odd years ago after her mother died. Like a penance he should pay, her childhood mind thought, but no, heart. An oxygen mask dangled from one red, supple ear. The nurse removed it. His arms lay outside the blanket and Nilesson could see the numerous crimson petals of hardened blood where they tried to find his veins. She kissed him on the forehead. Under his fingers, the fronds of his hair were like silk. Do you need to be with him? No, no, thank you. You can if you want. No. Walking back to the lift, she remembered a few weeks earlier, having to help him to the bathroom to wash him and change his nappy. State of me, he'd said, pathetically, almost a sob. She replied she wasn't bothered and she wasn't at all, not just because she'd been a nurse and was used to human substances, but because there was a kind of completeness to it. He'd been there when her nappies were changed, and now that duty fell to her at the end of life. Far from being something revolting to do, she thought of it as a privilege. Ground floor. The lift doors opened and let her out. Maybe she should have stayed at his bedside. Did it look bad that she hadn't? What were they doing now up there, washing him, packing him up for the undertaker? Her throat suddenly felt inexplicably dry, and she thought if she didn't tug her mask off, she might choke. She caught movement in her peripheral vision and heard a cry so searing and intimate she thought it was her own. She turned her head just as a pair of swing doors leading to a corridor opened and shut. As they swung closed, the scene beyond stuttered visually like a strip of film that had frames cut out. A series of still images, in fact. The petite, mixed-race woman with dreadlocks sat on the plastic bench, keening, bent forward, elbows on knees, holding a handkerchief to her face, chest heaving as she tried to stop the flow of tears. White guy of similar age, in his twenties, wearing a wrinkled t-shirt and patterned house pants, standing uselessly with one hand on her shoulder. Two middle-aged people behind, the older man with his forehead pressed against the wall. The girl was hysterical in grief, distraught at the world, at God. Alison knew the feeling. She remembered her dad's tears back when her mother's problem became too much to bear, when he'd sat, overspilling with sadness, at the end of her bed, when she was ten years old, and she'd cried too as she flung her arms around him, or pretended to. How could she have told him her problems when he had enough to deal with himself? She remembered like it was yesterday, asking him to leave the light on because she was afraid of the dark. But really it was not so much the dark as what was in the dark that scared her. Please, please leave the light on, Dad. Please. It was the job of her father to protect his daughter, but so many times it felt like she had to protect him. Alison found herself blinking, trying to focus her eyes on the exit sign through a liquidy film. Plastic chairs were lined in rows, an elderly man was hunched over, coughing behind his mask. An elderly woman with bloated ankles held his hand. Not far from them stood a man in motorcycle leathers, wearing a crash helmet and the visor down. Alison wondered why he hadn't raised the visor, or better still, taken the helmet off. It was odd that he hadn't. His head didn't move. She noticed a white zigzag crack across the plastic, not unlike a lightning bolt. He was standing ridiculously stock still, like a shop window mannequin, and she wondered why he wasn't being seen by someone, since he was obviously in need of urgent medical assistance, then wondered why he seemed to be looking directly at her, till she noticed blood dripping down his sleeve. It must have been pooling inside his gauntlet for some time because it was dropping from his fingertips and forming a wide puddle at his feet. The young woman's howl still echoed. Alison didn't want to hear them any more. She wanted to get out of there. She walked past the motorcycle man without looking at him. The sliding doors parted. She didn't look back at him as she entered the cold night air and darkness. Nice. Mm. Very good. What is it about moths? <laughs> Always creepy, aren't they? <laughs> I hate moths. Oh, that's very good, Stephen. Thank you. Just a taster. Yeah. Amazing. The funny thing, I, I should make an, uh, a reference here to Kieran because he uh, inadvertently, I, I, think I'm, I think I've told him this in the past, but he helped uh, a great deal with Afterlife because I visited a um, presentation that he did at Liverpool University mm. called The Rhetoric of the Medium. And that was very instructive to me when I was writing the character of Alison in terms of uh, the things that we now know about code reading, uh, about um, 
how mediums give the impression that they've given hits when in fact if you analyze the information afterwards they haven't given hits at all and it was uh, brilliantly instructive and all the nicer to uh, meet up with him later on and tell him how much how influential that had been oh. <laughs> thank you very much yeah brilliant yeah. brilliant i love that story the, the the excerpt you just read as well which is that whole uncanny feel isn't mm. it it's a familiar environment i was gonna say that yeah but something odd and unsettling about yeah. it is thrown in which is just yeah brilliant the unmanned desk in a hospital something really eerie about that for some reason yeah yeah, yeah. i think what i what I, what I tend to do when i'm writing stories now I, I must admit is um i try and say to myself what's the least i have to do to make this a horror story uh mm. not because i think it's very easy to write a horror or supernatural story that's over the top yeah, um, yeah yeah you know and and actually i i get more enjoyment from um, reading stories that have the little turn of phrase or the or the kind of observational moment of something that's not quite right you know than i do yes. the big scenes really um but when it all comes down to it i think it's uh, identification with the character that you're gonna live with for a few pages you know um mm. i think in a story that's about unreality you try and put in as much reality as you can to make it to make it convincing. Yeah, that's yeah. the game. At the end of the day, is to try and try and fake a kind of authenticity. And the only way to do that is to be kind of emotionally honest as much as you can be, because I think then you get a story that has an emotional impact. You know, beyond being just scary. Um, that's that's my theory, anyway. It's good. I mean, I think that's always true of all stories, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah, can yeah. Capture the the truth at the core of it then it's going to make it a better story. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you. We've we've kept you longer than we meant to, but it's been an absolute delight. Pleasure. And as we expected, full of brilliant insight as well. Yeah, yeah. So thanks very much for your time. Yeah. All right, great. Good to talk to you, thank both. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Been amazing. Thanks, guys. See ya. Take care. Bye-bye. I have a suspicion that Stephen has quite a strong fan base mm. because I noticed that there's a used copy of his short story collection, Dark Corners, which is a, a, a book of kind of ghost stories and stuff, going for £500 online. Oof. <laughs> we should have got him to sign something or something, <laughs> John. What were we thinking? No. It's probably worth getting yourself a couple of copies of his new book, the good unknown and other ghost stories. Just as an investment. Exactly. Just away. And then you can yeah. keep one and, you know, sell one for a profit a few years down the line. Wow. So go out and get yourself a copy of that. But also do check out Kieran O'Keefe in the new TV series of Uncanny. Oh, yeah, it's just started, hasn't it? That's on BBC, uh, off the yeah. back of the um, podcasts that were on uh, BBC Sounds. That's it, exactly. Yeah. With Danny Robbins. I did wonder, I, have you have you seen any of that? I did wonder, in the first episode, mm. they're down a suburban street. Mm. And, I, and I did wonder, I did mean to try and check somehow to see whether it was the same suburban street <laughs> that they used on Ghostwatch. Oh, my God, that would be so cool. That would be the sequel that yeah. Stephen never did. But I don't think it was. I think just suburban streets tend to look quite similar. <laughs> it just looked a bit But it just, it. It just uh, and, um, when it kind of framed up, it did just remind me of kind of one of the shots in Ghostwatch of kind of looking down the, the normal street. It's kind of a, a bit of genius, I think, using a, a, a boring suburban street. Yeah, very much. Well, we said in the interview, didn't we, you kind of either need to take it somewhere like a gothic castle with wind whistling through the ripped curtains, I might have you, or yeah. bring it somewhere completely normal and literally very close to home, where you think, what? Mess with your head a bit. Yeah, yeah. So in Uncanny, um, presented by Danny Robbins, he's basically presenting real-life spooky encounters. So you can, uh, yeah, have a look on uh, BBC iPlayer for that. That's being aired at the moment. You can see why Kieran's involved in exactly. that. It's perfect, isn't it, for him? Perfect material for him. And again, especially over this misty period of the year. Mm. But we'll stick the um, we'll stick a link in the episode notes. Have a look. Well, so we're going to do a Victorian Christmas spooky episode. Yeah. Is that a Victorian ghost stories? Yeah, that's what we were thinking, isn't it? I think that'd be nice. So I think we should probably give our listeners a little prod, shouldn't we, and see if there's anything they want to share. Yes. A spooky poem. Yeah. Or like maybe like a short story, a spooky short story. Yeah. yeah like three hundred and. 50 words or something of like, yeah. ooh, hair-raising tales. That would be wonderful. 
or even something that's happened to you, an actual real ghost story yeah. would also be good. We'd, we'll take any of that. Or maybe like a frightful limerick. Can you imagine, I don't know if anyone's done a like a properly spooky limerick. <laughs> I think we wrote a few of those. We did, well, ours were yeah. frightful. Well, apart from mine, that was the best limerick yeah. ever that involved a fellow with a cock like a paddle. But <laughs> apart from that, yeah. yeah, I think all ours were quite hair-raising, weren't they, in their own little way. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anything, anything you want to contribute to a... A Victor- does it? I mean, the Victorian thing, does that put an angle on it? Well, I don't think it has to be. I think. I mean, I love all that sort of gothic uh, Victorian. There is something special, isn't it, about that yeah. old-timey Victorian... That was the golden Dickensian era, wasn't it, of ghost spook. stories, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. R. James and all that. But, but yeah, it can be very modern, if you want. Just any ghost stories, anything yeah. that gives you the creeps. It's a good time of year for that. So get writing. I'm going to get you. What was that you said? Are you a voice in my head? Or am I going mad? Or are you actually dead? A ghost walking around with your hand Don't you know? This on my bed, it's gloopy and it's red. Oh dear, it seems I'm the one who's dead. But before you get writing, we thought that it would be quite interesting to take what we've learned today and just kind of recap. And I'd just have a chat about some some thoughts about what makes a good ghost story. Mm-hmm. And there are definitely things, you know, we don't want to get too prescriptive or anything, but there are definitely things that can help make your ghost stories. So let's let's barrel through that and then we'll let people go. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, we'll set the homework and then the bell will ring and then we'll let people go. So first up, right, well, we just talked about this, didn't we, actually? Mm. Uh, needing a great location. Yeah. So you dug out a little quote here, John, from Burley Doherty. Yeah. The setting is actually one of the main characters to consider when writing a ghost story. Once you've chosen the setting, you'll begin to have an idea about the other main characters. And that's a great way of looking at it, isn't it? Just how important the location is. It is. And obviously the location plays in any any story you write, the location does play into it. But very often it can be it's a background, it's a setting, it's somewhere just to put things on top of. Yeah. But it's also it is something you can play with, isn't it? Because most settings for a ghost story can be spooky if you mess around yeah yes yeah. well you said in the interview didn't you it's the um mm. the hospital but with an unmanned desk that's it the school with the flickering lights that's not quite that's it it's it's taking a normal location and taking it out of context yeah. isn't it sometimes or there are just spooky places like an abandoned mental institution yeah. or something yeah yeah like that's, that. that's i'll I mean, give you that one that's just like gold isn't it? yeah or churches or yeah, yeah. graveyard uh, secondly what's the voice of the narrator that's really important in a ghost story because Coming up with something original as well is is always good because some ghost stories uh, are told by letter or some are like stories told as truth mm-hmm. or some are, are told, you know, first person present tense, like yeah. they're happening right at that moment. Or like um, there's a Sheridan Le Fanu, uh story called Madame Crowell's Ghost. Sheridan Le Fanu is, uh, you know, he's like a, a Victorian really you know classic sort of uh ghost writer and horror writer but um that's told by an old lady describing a memory of when she was 13 years old and also using this really strong northern dialect to really place the story so there's lots of different ways of kind of using the voice as well to make it just seem like it's real. That's really important in a ghost story, isn't it? To bring it home, make it sound real. Yeah, so there's just got to be that little doubt in the reader's mind as to whether, is this, is this a story or is it actually real? Exactly. And, it, and all those little details that you can surround your story and just make everything, just set it a bit more in a, you know, in a real place. Uh, Tom? Yeah, well, we, uh, we just talked about this, really. The atmosphere, didn't we? Kind of, It does tie very much into the setting of just making things slightly off but not not going over not making it stupidly scared so if if it's set in a church not having creaks and doors banging and things Mm. happening but just that 
eerie silence. Yeah. Or like half a little glimpse of something that you think, well, what, what was... Or like you said in the, um, the introduction about the uh, Ghost Watch, where there was someone phoned in to say, rewind the tape, there was something there to see. Yeah. So it's like... It oh, is, what? it's that... You have half seen, you've half seen it, which is yes. what ghosts are, isn't it? It's that kind of... Was that a thing? What was that? It was something yeah. that just went by quickly. You don't get to sort of stand there and have a good chat with them. That's right. It's And it's, it is setting up... All of that stuff sets up this really uncanny atmosphere where something's just not quite right and you can't put your finger on it and somehow that's just so much more scary than there being something definitely wrong yeah it's like there's it just doesn't feel right and we've all had that feeling you know like walking around a you know a churchyard or something that's just something doesn't quite feel right it can be as simple as like a dog barking at thin air or in the in one of my favorites we were talking about in the um uh in the chat with Stephen in uh, a turn of the screw which is a great ghost story if you've never read it but um the the children in that story just them staring out the window at something that the governess can't see is just really scary they're looking at something in the garden and she can't see what that is and just that is really creepy mm-hmm. and they won't tell her what they've been looking at also one thing i mentioned in the um in that chat tommy yeah there's something about just to recap, finding out after the fact that you've been near something malevolent. Yes, no, you did. Well, we just mentioned that, didn't we, with the, with the rewind of the video thing. That's the same, same kind of thing, isn't it? That's yeah. it. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's, it's finding out that you've been haunted, but you didn't realise at the time. Yeah, yeah. There's that, there's that hand on your shoulder, which seems fine. But yeah. then later it's revealed there was no one else there. Yeah, it's somehow sort of, I don't know, whether it's like hard physical evidence that comes to light later. But in urban myth... Um, it crops up all the time, you know, and that you get that shiver factor from it. It's the um, it's the murdered friend. It's coming home to a to a friend who's been murdered, who you share a room with, uh, and there's like lipstick on the mirror that says it's a good job you didn't turn the light on. It's that kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That always works very well. Mm. What else you got? What, what else we got? got? Uh, well, in Jamesian ghost storytelling, there's often an object. Oh, yeah, Jamesian ghost storytelling, John. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, M.R. James, the the writer of ghost stories. Of, well, you got to be. If you, you get know. an entire, like, if you get an E.M. <laughs> about your name, then you must yeah, be. if you get a descriptive, a name descriptive, then, yeah, you're in, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Um, but there's, there's often an object that's connected to the ghost or the spirit world. In Ghost Watch, it's, it's basically the place, isn't it? It's the cupboard under the stairs is sort of the object. And there's a great, there's a brilliant story by M.R. James called Mezzotint. It's actually quite funny. It's sort of, and in some ways that makes it even kind of spookier, but it's, uh, in that story, the, the object is an engraving, which is bought by a collector. And it's this, uh, this picture of a house. But when the, the guy, the collector, looks at the engraving the next morning he notices a figure in the corner of the picture that he didn't notice the day before and then he goes out and he comes back later and he finds the figure in a slightly different position and they're climbing in through one of the windows in the house and the story kind of goes on like that but it's really really creepy so yeah using a some sort of object that's related to the ghost Anything else? Yeah, the next one is, is uh, quite interesting psychologically, actually, isn't it? The uh, the idea that you need a sceptical voice yeah. in a ghost story, or it's a good idea to have one. Sort of, a, so you've got someone that's this is ridiculous. Mm. Don't be stupid. And <laughs> yeah, then they yeah. get turned. They go, oh my god! And there's that moment of wait, wait, because as the reader, you might be on the, that side of the. There's a logical explanation for all this. Yeah. And then all of a sudden there isn't. <laughs> yeah. There's nowhere else to go. And that again, that just helps, doesn't it? It just helps set everything in a more realistic space yeah but i think in the chat as well i think it was Stephen that said about the two options you've got in a ghost story are either that you've seen a ghost or you're going mental when you get to that point that break point of going right this mm. isn't this doesn't make any sense actually mm. you've either got to think well i must be losing it then, which none of us want to think yeah, there's yeah. something supernatural at play so that skeptical voice is a good way of getting to that tipping point of that where that has to be a, yeah, yeah. a thought process I like that the other thing that uh, that we talked about was the ghost should always somehow represent the flaw in the protagonist. They have to they have to be related. That was interesting. Like, that t- yeah, mm. I never never really considered but that. That's really right, isn't it? In all the best ghost stories, there's something about that character, that main character, that ties in with the ghost in a really 
you know, clear way or ties in with the themes of that ghost story. Because often ghost stories aren't actually about a ghost. You know, they're, they're about, they're kind of about something else. Oh, yeah. And sometimes massively explicitly. Do you mean like something like Scrooge? Yeah. That's, yeah, exactly. Obviously, the entire that's thing good, is hung around ghosts. Shout, yeah. But they're, they are completely just there to mirror the flaws, massive flaws in the protagonist. Although, I guess, is is that a ghost story? It's got ghosts in it. Is that an, that's like a, an entirely different question, isn't it? About when, is, when is a ghost story a ghost story? Yeah. There's a great, yeah, um, uh, there's a great ghost story. Uh, who's it by Elizabeth Bowen called The Demon Lover? And that's a great ghost story. Mm. I recommend that one, it's quite short. But that is that's almost more about the world wars than it is about a ghost, although it's totally about a ghost, right? But it's about the, I suppose, the, the, the trauma of war in a way. That's a good example of that. You know, the themes tying in with the characters, tying in with the ghost and what the ghost represents. Uh, anything else? Do you know what is a classic uh, ghost story element? What? Is, is kind of towards the end, really, where we realise it's like all of us, we said before, you know, where you kind of think, yeah, the ghost's not real. And then you get to the point of, oh, my God, it is real. Mm. And then there's a point where it's just too late to do any. The, the, previously, you could have avoided the situation or done something to mitigate it or to, mm. to leave or whatever. But then there's the point where because you didn't believe, because you weren't believing your own eyes, if you like, mm. it's just too late to do anything. Mm. You're trapped. You're done. And that's often, that is often in a ghost story, the point at which the story ends as well. <laughs> so you don't actually get to find out what happens to the character. So they're stuck in eternity or the something terrible is just destined to happen and there's literally no way off that path. Good example of that, Joyce Carol Oates wrote uh, a very famous short. It's not really a ghost story. It's a, yeah, it's just, it's one of those sort of uncanny stories that's just really disturbing called Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? And that's a great example of that is that you can see it coming a mile away and the character can't. And it's just, it just gets to a point where it's just horrible. It's clever and hard to write something like that as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really Where, where is. you kind of got you keeping the character in blinkers. Yeah, yeah. And you're practically screaming at the page. Yeah. And the last thing which Stephen mentioned, or did he mention it? I think he, maybe it was in one of his essays about ghost writing ghost stories. But I think it's really good. But it's, the, it's good for the ghost to have a motive, you know, there's there's something that the ghost wants. If the ghost doesn't want anything, then there's no point in having it. Like, what 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 are they trying to achieve with their haunting? It's a kind of an important thing, isn't it? Yeah. But also, he does say, remember that a ghost story isn't a detective story, and <laughs> and he mentions that this is really true. That a lot of horror films, especially like ghost story horror films, these days they turn into detective stories that needs solving. Do you know what I mean? It's like the ghost wants something. Yeah. You, as a character, need to work out what it is that they want in order to stop the hauntings. But that's not really a ghost story anymore because you re- you're resolving something. The whole point of a ghost story, in a way. Is that, is that to do with having wanting to have an ending and a happy ending? Yeah, and, uh, that's classic Hollywood resolution, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, right, not being willing to leave it as a... And probably the ghost haunted them for the rest of their lives or skinned them alive or did whatever to them. Yeah, and probably also the uh, the length of a feature film, I'm guessing, as well. Yeah. In order to get your beats right, you need to actually resolve something. Yeah. That's not really the point of a ghost story. So there you go. There's our little, uh, our little gift to you, dear listener. Uh, just some pointers. Hopefully you found that useful. Hopefully we found it Hopefully useful. Hopefully you've been inspired to write some little uh, tales of ghostly goings yeah. on. Bonus points for setting them in the Victorian era for our Christmas special. Because <laughs> it just makes it scarier. Yeah. Uh, what are we doing next week, Tommy? Next week is our uh, Nano Remo Rimo uh, help. Yeah, we're helping to kick it off. Yeah. With a nice little episode with Howard Mittelmark. Yeah, who we said uh, wrote a book, How Not to Write a Novel, with lots of hundreds of points about the pitfalls and common mistakes and cliches mm. that people fall into and how to avoid yeah. them. It sounds weirdly negative, that, doesn't it? But it's actually really useful. It is, and it's it's, uh, it's a great book in terms of how... It's very light, isn't it? It's lovely light yeah, reading. It's funny. And it is funny, yeah, but uh, very, very helpful. So, yeah, tune in for that next week. Yeah. you can get your writing socks on. Do people have... I people have writing do, socks yeah. on. I think everyone yeah. has a special pair yeah, of writing yeah. socks, yeah. Tom. Yeah. Get your writing socks on for NaNoWriMo Ramo Ramo. And, uh, yeah... Help yeah. me churn out the numbers, get Brilliant. those words out. And happy Halloween, everyone. Should we finish? We could finish with a little competition, Tom. 
Should we see who can do the best evil, maniacal laugh to see everyone out? All right, then. Yeah, should we give that a go? Yeah. Uh, do you want to go first, or should I go first? <laughs> you go first. I want to know what I'm okay. up against. Good night, everybody. Sleep well. Don't have nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> That was mine. Right. What would you give that would, out of 10? Oh, it's all right. I thought it was all right. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, thanks, strong, man. Strong seven there, at least. Oh, brilliant. That's good. Uh, right, I'll give it a go as well. <laughs> oh, nice building. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> I went. I went for the subtle. I went for the. Oh, it's actually that was a lot scarier than disturbing. Mine. Sometimes it's that, yeah, that we said really in the thing, creepy. wasn't it? That kind of like little underneath. Play it down. Play it yeah. down. Yeah. That's a lesson to us all, Tom. It's a great, uh, great way to finish. Well, sp- do you know, speak quickly before we go. Speaking about lessons, do you remember last week's episode, John? I do. Yeah, I do actually. Talked to Andy Stanton uh, about yeah. ChatGPT and AI, mm. and I thought I would be clever and call last week's episode how to write a book using chat gpt because i was being ironic because obviously that's not really what the episode was about and yes. uh it's not what andy did per se but he did and some people on twitter were kind of accusing him of literally doing that of writing a book using yeah, yeah. so i thought well it'd be funny and ironic a good title and think about the google think about the search we'll be up on the googles because oh, people yeah. will be whacking in that into google and searching that and they'll be getting real riled yeah up. exactly yeah. and then we can go well maybe you shouldn't be doing that and they can listen and learn <laughs> and stuff anyway so i put that i put the type literally the title of our episode into google mm. and uh it didn't come up on any of the searches it was completely <laughs> obliterated by the entire internet being saturated with get rich quick. Oh my Flood God. Amazon with your terrible books written by ChatGPT, oh, YouTube guides geez. and websites. Uh, so, yeah, that was depressing. That is so upsetting. Crazy, crazy. But yeah. so much stuff there, but just like proper, like dirty get but rich people quick. selling their knowledge of ChatGPT in order to help you write your ChatGPT book. You yeah, know? basically. And yeah, just websites and YouTube mm. guides of. of uh, what to put in, how to do it quickly. How depressing. Just how to get 100 books on Amazon oh, in a week God. or whatever. Or I'd be really intrigued to read one, actually, and feedback on that. Because I think it does, it obviously bothers me. Yeah. And I find it uh, massively disturbing. But I'd be intrigued to see just what level it's reached currently. Because surely... Well, I mean, we've read we've read stuff. I mean, admittedly, it was the the you know Gen three rather mm, than Gen mm. four, but surely it's not writing actual decent books. But is it going to be writing stuff that's good I just, enough? I can't quite believe that. That's 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 all it needs to get to, isn't it? Of, of generally but, good enough that someone's going to buy it and <sighs> maybe not love it, but meh, all right. <laughs> do you mean that's all that that's all the trying? I suppose to... there are books out there that do okay that are like that. Yeah, I mean. If people are willing to, it's, I mean, it's just hard enough to sell a book anyway, isn't it? Yeah. The amount of money you'd have to spend marketing. I guess the it. idea is if you can churn out a hundred books in a week. Yeah, yeah. And just make a time. You only need money, to make a hundredth of the amount that you would oh, churn out one book. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, um, I'm going to try and find one. The problem is I'm going to have to pay for it, aren't I? And I don't want to give Probably. anyone any money well, just on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it would be interesting to read something, I think. Uh, yeah. But then maybe not because that might just be really terrifying. <laughs> yeah. It's already writing better than I am, yeah. which is probably quite likely. Um, that is just too depressing. Okay, well, let's put the lid back on that. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's just, do that. Yeah. Let's just, hi- Tommy, let's just stick our heads in the sand. Yeah, why not? Go la, 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 and carry on with our lives Absolutely. like we normally do. All right. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. We shall uh, speak to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Where's everybody gone?